All right, so I just kind of briefly went over um, some aspects of George Washington. And again, I just want to kind of remind you guys what I'm actually doing with these lectures because the lectures that I'm actually doing right uh, here are not necessarily typical what I would do in a um, faced, uh, uh, in an in-class setting uh, where I might even go over more details point for point of the um, of the events taking place. But what I wanted to do is, is since we're utilizing various aspects of the media, to kind of highlight events and certain people and some ideas going on with the American uh, Revolution. And then I'm going to show you some documentary clips and some lectures to kind of fill in those gaps along with the chapter uh, uh, reading of the textbook which you should be doing and the Zen book and hopefully by putting this all together this can give you a, a broad kind of perspective set of views uh, on on important uh, events and people and you, you know I, I always encourage you have to be skeptical with YouTube and uh, Google and that where the sources are and how credible that they are um, that's always the challenge and I try to always make sure that even when I'm looking over um, various things that I think would be great for you guys that it's actually you know a solid source uh, and when I say solid of course left-wing or right-wing is, is a political perspective right but then there's like false information or positive. So example, I just want to kind of say just briefly, you look at the debate that you saw with uh, Buck, uh, William Buckley and um, and with Huey Newton from the Black Panthers. They didn't actually have a debate about history. They had a debate or discussion about perspectives or the way of looking at it. And in some cases, they saw things very similar in regards to the revolution and other things different. But there was not a debate about the sources or the actual event happening it was about the perspective right and so the trick is to always find things that give you solid information and then you can sift through the perspective and see if that resonates with you or not if that makes sense you know part of teaching history is not just to actual teach the historical events but to teach you how to read history and i had one student who was um kind of even questioning the whole uh um you know validity uh, of it because of this um I think that there's enough solid scholarship and ideas that always help us know the, the relative truth of a certain time period, especially when we get to modern history. But in fact, those perspectives, new information do change things from time to time, right? So the way that I'm teaching U.S. history right now with you is different than how it would have been taught before. And it's a little bit different than taught in high school because the nationalist narrative um, would be to strictly teach everything that highlights things that make us look good and you can feel proud of. And I, I kind of want to return back to this theme because Howard Zinn is also celebrating America. He's just celebrating a different America than the establishment. He's basically saying that people who revolted in the streets that lived here were just as legitimate in their uh, uh, thoughts and their life to be brought up as and a rich aristocrat that gets you know known like let's say George Washington okay and so um, I think that this is a different way of celebrating the legacy but at the same time um, people go to other extremes where you do have people then seeing nothing good and you have somebody seeing uh, uh, something only good and what I'm hoping is that we kind of go through these things and we see that like all historical events it's never that simple or it's not usually that simple okay um it doesn't mean we can't take sides we're just more aware of all the various perspectives okay so having uh restated that again i'm going back now i want to talk about the uh, declaration of independence remember this is not when we became independent i think i made a mistake in, in one of my lectures earlier saying this july 4th that we celebrate is our declaration that's given to the british Okay, um, you can declare something. It doesn't mean you have it unless you actually can get it. So this could have been a declaration that uh, never actually was fulfilled. It just so happens that we know that it was. 
And so the most important uh, lines, and there's no doubt that as Americans, we've, we've held this document to be nearly a sacred uh, uh, um, document. And the language uses a, a, a spiritual um, language, right? Just like we saw in some of the earlier texts. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay, now there's several things going on in the statement. One, that truth can be self-evident. You don't, you don't need, even need to quote the Bible or a, 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 an ancient law text, something coming from the British Isles. No, no, no. Self-evidence that all men are created equal. Oof. Now there's the tricky clause that many of the slave holders are not going to like that's put in there. Even back then. So remember I told you that the slave debate and those issues were always there. Okay. But thank God as you as many would say that it was put there because one it's there and when it says that all men are created equal it's something that you can't take back if you're going to hold the, the text sacred even if it really wasn't true it wasn't believed by the writers that all men were created equal it's a fact they had slaves so men are all equal <laughs> right so, so we need to like come to terms with that this was a false statement in terms of what they actually believed but they said it and it's going to be the best line that we're going to have to help make a, a, a justification later on for those who are not treated equal look you said it now you got to commit okay and in fact martin luther king jr later is going to say if you didn't say that then we would we wouldn't have an argument to make legally he basically said we're not even radicals, those of us against segregation later on. We're merely holding you accountable to that which you've already stated and celebrate, uh, uh, right? Okay, the self-evident truth that all men are created equal. All right, so something to just point out. Now, it doesn't say women. We've talked about that a little bit already, okay? And uh, the Supreme Court later is going to say that equality doesn't imply things like, for instance, the right to vote that's later than going to get changed, okay? So yes, we can't neglect the fact that in the middle of discussion with, discussion of slaves that um, women weren't a part of that discussion. And so that's something that's, that's, that's a global cultural issue, okay? If you look at the, the text of Confucius, everything is about male-to-male -male relations. Women are basically just supposed to be subservient to all the hierarchies of male uh, relations, period, okay? Um, you see it within Islam, you see it within Judaism and Christianity, the husband is the head of the wife. Now how that's interpreted and what that means, I realize everyone that this can be interpreted in many different ways, it doesn't, but all I'm simply saying is if you look at the trends of world culture, this was um, standard, okay? Slavery and male dominance uh, at the expense of women were the common trends of the world. And from this time period, we're seeing those things become more and more questions. The seeds were there. So that's what also makes this document interesting and this legacy of the revolution is that these contradictions that we see are the contradictions that are emerging out of a, 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 a world, in particular a European world, that is trying to resolve these things, okay? I mean, that's how I see it, because if you look at the Enlightenment thinkers and you look at the context of what they're writing and talking about, these are uh, um, people who are questioning long-held ideas, okay? And, um, you know, just something I want you to talk, think about there. Okay, so then the next line, uh, they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. So now it gets even more solid. God gave human beings rights that you cannot, uh, that there's nothing that can mute them, okay? And that you should have that right to life, liberty, and uh, um, there was the idea of pursuit of private property. No, but here it says happiness. So life, liberty, and happiness, okay? 
And keep in mind again that for many of the writers, this idea of a creator is a personal God, is Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. There are some that are actually having that view. Others are coming out of that European tradition that they're into deism. And deism is like what I talked about with Thomas Paine, which is that they believe in God. They will use the language of the of, of theology of, of, of a Christian, but they don't have that belief that in a personal deity. And they also believe in the morality of Jesus. So where it gets hard to tell what the religious beliefs of some of these um, uh, more elites are thinking is that the Bible is celebrated to them, Christianity in many ways, and the idea of God. But in fact, their views would be considered heretical, uh, uh, quite damning to a more conservative form of Christianity. But they're able to kind of um, blend in, so to speak. And we, we know about these things through the things that they wrote, okay? And so it gets kind of complicated, again, when I, we're covering the legacy of religion in this country. But one thing that, that we know for sure, they're writing to an audience that believes in these things. And as Thomas Paine acknowledged, you know, the, 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 the use of the language of God appeals to the masses. Okay, so I just want to point that out. And so that means the masses were uh, um, very religious for the most part. Now, it also says, He the king was, uh, referring to the king, has constrained our fellow citizens, taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become executioners of their friends and brethren, are to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Wow. Um, I'm not quite sure what that means, uh, destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions, but it sounds pretty thorough, right? <laughs> um, so here it's interesting, you know, the founding fathers here are in fact, let's face it, they are the rebels. There is, this is a rebellion, a revolution against the established authority. And here they're saying, no, it's you, you are, are creating problems to us and you are instigating against us. So see how the two different sides are, are, are doing this. And this is how all conflicts right, work, right? Okay. Um, you know, for 9-11, uh, just for example, I, I have to go there to say, for many Americans, that's the beginning of the conflict. For the manifesto of Al-Qaeda, they're saying this is a response to us. Now, I'm just showing you, I'm not getting into this, I'm not taking sides with Al-Qaeda, relax. What I'm just pointing out is that, um, again, conflicts, who's starting what is always the debate, right? Okay, now... So to them, again, it was the British then that were making it harder for them and to dealing with the natives. So again, the Declaration of Independence did not apply to the people uh, uh, who originally lived here. And in fact, the Indians were, were, were referred to as savages and not incorporated into this inalienable uh, uh, rights because they were seen as a part of, outside of civilization. Okay, And we also have to deal with that. So we have to deal with who's left out in this right all men are created equal are indian savages men are blacks men are they created equal this is the kind of thing. but again as native americans and uh, uh uh black americans and women over time get involved in politics what's going to be muted out is the savage part is the, the is 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 the uh, men only part, but the idea of inalienable rights, the idea of self-evident fact of of people created equal. Okay, so I think that the legacy of of the Declaration is quite wonderful, despite all of the contradictions and what it leaves out. As long as we acknowledge what was left out and what was contradicted, then um, it truly still holds to be a powerful statement about. Uh, freedom and liberty, right? Well, that's just my thought, okay? All right, I'm going to end this here.